I'm really happy to have Joey Sellers with me today because all the people I interview are thousands of miles away. <laughs> but Joey came 10 minutes down the road. Not even, half mile. Half a mile. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? So thanks for coming. My pleasure. It's a great pleasure. And I don't usually get to talk to people about one of my favorite subjects, which is actual teaching. And I know you're a great composer. I know you're a fantastic trombone player. And uh, I'm going to talk about trombone jokes later, but okay. we're not going to talk about those now. What I want to ask is, uh, I know that you started teaching kind of later in life. Yeah. But the first thing I want to ask is, what was the thing that you were thinking, okay, what am I going to teach? How did you formulate your own curriculum? Because I assume you were teaching... Joey Sellers, you weren't teaching a, somebody else's course, or is that right? That's correct. It's it's an interesting thing. Uh, at the time I got offered my first teaching position, it was at Northern Illinois University, which is in DeKalb, Illinois, which is about an hour west of Chicago. Nice. There's not much there except for the university. Right. Uh, I okay. think that's the town where they invented barbed wire to keep the cows out of the corn. <laughs> the story, the apocryphal story that the guys who had been there for a while told me is that they actually diverted the Kishwaukee River in the 19th century when they were thinking about where they were going to put that college and made it go through DeKalb, so they chose it. That's nice, what they're saying. Nice. Anyhow, so I was coming there uh, 37 years old, had been a freelancer my entire life, had nice. very lucky to have had steady employment at Disneyland before we moved out to New York, you know. Right. And and so really it was the when I was in New York, it was the first time I was struggling, you know. Right. Which right. was good. Right. And, of course, the intensity of the New York seen musically and otherwise was really great for my soul sure so we were sort of reluctant to leave but our daughter had just been born and i thought my academic pedigree is not that great uh -huh. you know i barely got my undergrad degree because we right. got that job at disneyland prior to my graduate okay. so i eventually got my undergrad degree i love school it's not that i'm anti-school but i just no. i was just playing and i wasn't thinking about it you right know? i'm relatively thoughtless about every aspect of my life until i was 34 and determined that i was going to move to new york right which is kind of late to go right so uh, I it was a one-year visiting position. and We had just bought a house in Roselle Park, New Jersey, so I was anticipating being there for one year. And when I got there, like you said, Richard, it wasn't, it was complete, I had complete license to do it how I wanted. Now, I paid attention. Paul McKee had been doing it. He's a wonderful composer and trombonist from okay. Woody's band, most famously. He's in the Denver area <clears throat> now. And he and I talked, literally the first time we talked, for about seven hours on the phone. You right. know, it was a long conversation. And I needed help. Right. And, and quite frankly, I was just explaining this to someone else the other day. As the more I teach, it's like the more you're a musician, sure. more doors open. Of course. And the more I teach, I feel like, I okay, this worked and that didn't work. But I still feel like a neophyte in many ways because the art of teaching, though separate from the art of music, is its own art in and of itself. Absolutely. And I can still, right to this moment, <clears throat> taste that first day when I went into a jazz comp class at Northern and realized that I didn't know how to share any of that information. But like most composers uh, in our world, many, I should say, I was autodidact. I was, you know, I didn't learn in a school or anything. Right. I just learned by okay. doing it from right. when I was a teenager. I just mm -hmm. started writing, actually, before that. But I had formed my 11 piece band when I was a teenager. So in terms of developing a curriculum, it took me some time. And I'm still developing it you know, I, I, you're still changing things up to try to be more successful. Now, sure. the difference between teaching the students at Northern Illinois University and the students that we have at Saddleback College right. is completely different. Right. You have to take a completely different tack. So once right. I took the job out here in 2002, after three years at Northern, I had to completely change any pedagogical things I had done. And, Not and any, why many. is that? Why? The students who would come into Northern all went to the Jamie Abersall camps, man, right. and they could shred. Like, I remember right. one of my now friends, Doug Stone, who's the jazz dude at LSU now. He was a freshman the first year I got there in 2002, and I was auditioning people for the various bands when I was playing piano, and I thought I'd cut him by playing rhythm changes in B, you know, <laughs> and he, he could do it, you know, because right. they all practice that. Sure. Uh, uh, so the, the fact of the matter is that the students we get at Saddleback 
become excellent musicians, but right. they don't necessarily start there. I see. So that's the difference is we're having to go back several steps right. on the number line to right. get the fundamental knowledge there. Right. It's a, I'm very proud of the fact that within two years, we can get them to basically the same place that some of those students at Northern were at. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, that, that, but, but like when you started, I'm still going to go back to this. Mm -hmm. How did you decide, okay, I'm going to walk in, I'm going to make some notes. Here are the things I'm going to teach. How did you decide which things? Because, I mean, I don't know exactly what you were teaching. I'm assuming you were teaching, I'm assuming, and maybe I'm wrong, that you were teaching composition or harmony or some kind of... So when I got the job at Northern, I was the second in command. The Ron Carter, not the bass player, the saxophone player right. from St. Louis was in charge there. Excellent educator, really a great mentor to me in terms of here's here's how you function in this world. Before right. you back into. Right. So I was teaching the second big band, uh, combos, um, jazz see. theory, and jazz composition. Okay, and great. the interesting thing about that particular program is that the jazz theory classes, most of the time they would have, most institutions would have the students take two years of classical or normal theory and then go to jazz. Right, At right, Northern, right. They hit right off the bat. So I had to work with Dr. Klonowski to make sure we were doing it. And he asked me if I could solfege. Right. On, and I said, I don't think we can solfege on giant steps. I, I'm going to have to use numbers. You know, right, he, right. he was great. He yeah. was a wonderful person with which to work. Right, right, Super. Right. There was none, none of that thing. In some academic institutions, as you know, Richard, jazz is looked down on as the bad boy or the bastard child. Sometimes. Sometimes. It wasn't in that school. I mean, I was lucky to go to Berkeley. Berkeley's a different animal. Yeah, different yeah. animal. But yeah. in many institutions, that was the case. <clears throat> yeah. um, and some nearby here. Yeah. So there was none of that there, and there's none of that at Saddleback. Everyone's wonderful there. Right. So, yeah, in terms of what I was going to do, and I'll, I'll, it'll be a sort of a confessional here, I kind of did it like I did my uh, learning about improvisation and, and composing. I call it the shrapnel technique. I, I had a general vague idea of conceptual things that I wanted to do, but I'm, I wasn't writing out specific things. Right. And quite frankly, I didn't do that until I got to Saddleback. Right. When I had, was teaching more fundamental things, because the students at Northern had a, a, a knowledge of the culture and the technical aspect, the cult, both the historical, right, right, the culture, right, right. and the technical exactly. aspect. Exactly. Sometimes that doesn't happen at Settle. Sometimes it does. Right. I've had right. wonderful students here. Right. Now, so that being said, I oftentimes was just shooting from the hip. And one day, I remember, this is I still do this today in the jazz comp class. After teaching for about two weeks, I realized, you know what? We're just going to get some transparencies. I'm old school and overhead projector, and we're going to go through what I would do if I were arranging a song. Right. And we picked. I had them pick a standard. Okay. Exactly. How are we going to do the entry? And we did that for about three weeks. Two Collective classes. arranging. Exactly. It's like, yeah. why are we making this choice? Right. How are we going to voice this? Exactly. I found it extremely helpful because, again, you don't want it to be academic. One of the worst things that's happened to us is we've codified the language in academic institutions. And in we're not now students are coming out and they're not understanding the creative aspect yes. or how to be an individual as an artist. They're just yeah. all kind of like here's our bebop licks, you know, right. which is detrimental yeah. to the music. It's what I call the the what and the how rather than the why. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing that I find over the years because I've always had a very active career, but I've always been teaching a little in different ways at different places or privately and I've noticed over the years that the students they're the n newer crop of say the last 10 years mm -hmm. or something 15 years they really want to you know be playing and impressive and all of that stuff but they don't have the knowledge of the past and the and the inspiration uh, where somebody says, well, I just really loved Bill Evans and I really wanted to figure out what he was doing and I really wanted to, so I started. Uh, I don't find that as much today. Now, I don't know if that's your experience. This is a problem and this is this is why I was saying there's the, the three-pronged thing. Well, maybe there's four, I don't know. But what gets neglected a lot is the historical and the cultural. And yes. those are two distinct things, really. Yes, yes. You know? So if you have a kid who's coming in and has chops, you know, yes. has some technical prowess and right. knows, has to play like, David Baker, jazz late. No, no, no <laughs> slam on David. David, that's what the cats at I no, no, used to no, tell sure, me when sure, I, in sure. 83 when I was working with them yeah. while I was still in college. And yeah. I love David. Yeah. And um, so, uh, but I mean, there's a way that that doesn't. Now, that being said, I do, at, reluctantly, after my first year at Northern, I did start to write down that vocabulary, which was anathema to me. It was, right. It killed my soul. But 
it was a quicker way to transfer the information. That being said, I would tell him, the best way to get this information is not from my stupid paper that you guys kind of forced me to do, right. but by transcribing. Right, exactly. the, the transcribing is where, that, right. then you're getting the feeling of it, you know? Right. And again, no slam on Abersold, but when those, you're playing with those play-alongs, mm. that to me is, is sort of a technical thing, but I like to play with the original recordings. That's right. Because yeah. even though you're kind of stepping on John Coltrane and Elvin or whatever, sure, you're yeah. getting that spirit while you're playing. <clears throat> exactly. It's different than, you know, doing it in the Abersol has its place. I know exactly. many of my colleagues on the faculty at Selvick use them. I, I don't use them as much, uh, but maybe that's because I, I try to outline the changes without anything sometimes too. But I feel like I'm digressing here, Richard. You're not. Okay. I, 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 okay. I, this is all the stuff I want to talk about. Okay. So, so there's going to be this technical aspect. Here, I just, yesterday in the improv class, like here's a dominant bebop thing, and it's a, kind of a dumb way to do it. And I remember a very wonderful guy in his mid-30s now, Craig Kamel, was one of my students, and he said to me, and I agreed with him, he said, those licks are stupid. I don't want to play those licks. Right. But they sounded better than what he was playing at the time. Exactly. And I said, they're only stupid when you can play them. Right. If you can't play them, they're not stupid yet. Yeah, and one of the things that I that I do is I, I urge people to transcribe, but I also say, okay, here's one phrase. I, I try not to call them licks because mm -hmm. it, it's kind of a... Pejorative term. It yeah. is. But I say, okay, so now there's that phrase. Now write me four different versions of that phrase. That's, using the ideas of that. Uh -huh. Okay, so there's this interval he's using. D do it, but use something else. That's excellent. And, and so I think, I find that's really helpful. And then I say, okay, now write this phrase, but use an upper structure triad in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, write this phrase, but tr transcribe it so that you're now using fourths or right. some interval, valid thing. So I get them to think, and then they think, well, wait, I can, now I can figure out my own ideas. Right. That that's are, that, setting them on that path. Yeah, yeah, but you start with something that's, you know, Concrete. Paul Desmond, yeah. which is the most melodic thing you can possibly yeah. choose, yeah. and then try to see if there's a reason, and why are you doing that? Why, why did Paul do that is the question. Exactly. That's, and that's exactly. really important. Instead of just regurgitating it, how is Tommy Harrell, and that's where I stole a lot of my right. vocabulary from for the students sure. at Northern. Sure, Why is he using it? Well, a lot of it came from Lee Morgan, of course, but right. how is it functioning? And, and that's important. Now, this begs another issue, and I have uh, different feelings on this. Um, you're talking about notating it down. Mm. Some people, including myself at various points, right. consider notating it down uh, evil. Like, you know, how certain indigenous cultures didn't want their photo taken because well, it would steal their soul. Okay. So, yeah, I, I, I know I've, it's, I've heard that. it's a matter, but it's funny because when I was at Northern, I was asked by Jazz at Lincoln Center to do some uh, <clears throat> transcribing for these historical projects. And these were going to be things that went in a library. So it wasn't like I was just going to knock off a transcription half-assed and, you know, let it go. Right. We wanted it to be right. And right. I actually, it led me to have conversations with people that I never would have otherwise. It was really wonderful. Well, but so one of them was a Louis Armstrong thing. And I said, you know, we're stepping on tender ground here when we're notating a solo by Louis Armstrong. I was hesitant to do it, hmm. but we had to. Hmm. And so I said, I just want you to know I'm doing this under protest. No one should ever learn this by reading it, they should learn it by imitating it in, with sound. Yeah. That being said, I do a lot of notating out licks, you well, know. Yeah. And it's, it, but we need to understand what the limitations of that are. Yeah, and, and also, I mean, I, I totally ascribe to the concept that composition is very slow improvisation and, and improvisation is very fast composition. Absolutely. So there is no difference between the two. Uh, obviously, reading is a problem for some people because they don't do a lot of it. I mean, it's just yeah. like, it's like anything. It's like playing tennis. If you haven't played for two years, you're going to be crap when you go out on the There was some court. funny moments coming out of the pandemic when big bands started getting well, back well, together. Well, I mean, well, we were all laughing about well, it because we hadn't read it. Well, actually, years. some people used the pandemic and did nothing but, but practice. So, yeah. so there's... But that, that's different than reading in a big band. Well, yeah, well <laughs> oh, definitely, definitely, yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. funny, man. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's all, there's all kinds of ways to skin a cat. Mm -hmm. But but also uh, one of the things I always feel is that each person is different. We're all we all have different things that we're drawn to, and, and as a teacher, I'm sure that you have found that 
Some things work with some people, but some things work better with other people. So some approaches, I mean, have you, do you have any specific examples of that? Yeah. One of the most, like I was saying, one of the hardest things of switching gears from Northern to Saddleback is that Northern, the students would come in, they were all student age students, first of all. Right. And they would come in and they would all be on the same, in the same place. At Saddleback, you might walk into an improv class and have people, one guy who can play giant steps and another individual who doesn't know what the notes are in an F major triad. Now, right, right. we have okay. prerequisites and things set up, but we also have this numbers game we have to play right. in the community college system. Right, so we want right. to, So it's been really interesting for me, and I found, it's been interesting to me, Richard, I found that after my first two years at Saddleback, when I kind of figured it out, the first two years, there were mornings I would wake up and I would say, this is like living in a Fellini movie, man, because right. things were so whacked out. Right, but we, right, we right. got it together. Mm. And what it is, is you need to find a way to have the big net where this guy can move at that rate, and this individual over here, may, she may have to move at a different rate, mm. or he, she or he, whoever. Yeah. And that the art of teaching like that taught me a lot. It also taught me something else, because I saw students come in who couldn't read and really couldn't play. And... Uh, I'm not going to use any names that might embarrass him, but no. one of our students, you know, was with us for more than two years and was spent 12 to 14 hours in the practice room at the end of the hallway. We'd all see him there when he wasn't in ensembles or classes. Mm -hmm. And he went on to uh, NYU. No, the new school. Okay. And did right. very well. Right. And, you know, is doing great. Right. So it taught me, Saddleback taught me that work ethic is more important than talent. Oh, uh, yes. Absolutely. And it took me, I, I actually didn't think you could teach certain things coming into it as well, a 37 year old because yeah. I had just been a freelancer my whole right. life. Now, that was a very sort of uh, humbling and enlightening, both humbling and enlightening lesson to learn. Right. After seeing that that work ethic makes more, has more value than talent. Well, that's an interesting point. And then we have to talk about what actually is talent. Because to me, it's, uh, it, it's an aptitude and it's a way of thinking. And if you work really hard at something, you obviously will develop what people call talent. I'm not even sure if talent exists. It has to do with, with how much you are willing to, I mean, you can't, it, it's a, the amount of work you put into it, as you say, yeah. the work ethic. I'm fascinated by that concept. I don't even know if talent exists. That's good. I don't. Yeah, right. I don't. Yeah, that's I, I don't. And I and I hate it when people say so and so is a genius. Talented individual. I can't yeah. stand the word genius because yeah, yeah, I don't like it's genius. just not. It's it it indicates oh well he's a genius and I could never achieve that so I might as well not bother. Right. It's a it's a laziness word uh, yep. to me. Genius. I agree. I don't and, like genius uh, either. And uh, I also, but but the why really interests me mm -hmm. because, I mean, with me it was really easy because my dad was a musician. I heard him playing in the living room with Joe Venuti all the time. So wow. that that kind of gives you, as a kid, a reason to think, oh, that sounds so good. I wish I could do that. Yeah, you know. Right. So that's obvious. That's the why. You know. Yeah. I I heard the Claude hunger. Williamson playing in my living room. Wow. You know. So, yeah. The yeah, hunger. You know. Is it there. was just that. That sounds so beautiful. And you know. And I watched my dad play the guitar, and I watched my uncle play the piano, and I said, "How can I possibly get to do that?" Mm -hmm. So that's the why for me. But it's interesting to find the why in various students because they have different reasons. It's always going to be different. I I I mean, there might there must be some commonalities. I've never thought about it as much as I perhaps should have. But the, the why is extremely important. And Gary Foster had this thing he used to say, you know, when he was teaching at Pasadena City College, he would say, first, you have to have the desire. That comes before everything else. Hmm. And I've, you know, I've, like I said, those first two years at Saddleback, we, we created a culture. I mean, like, for instance, you know, guys were just kind of, they didn't understand the amount of work that it took, it's particularly here in South Orange County. There's a sort of a, uh, a sense of entitlement, you might say, in, in this part of the country. And certainly, it was different than when I lived Among in Brooklyn. Some people, sure, <laughs> in Brooklyn. It was, yeah, right. You know, so, uh, and, and the, there's an intensity there with those students when we were in Brooklyn. You know, right? They just—it's just the environment, you know, because uh, it's hard to cross the street there, and you know, it's easier here. You know, so right. this this concept of of where we're going to meet the students is extremely important. And I remember saying one day, "Does it seem odd to anyone here to my students?" that no one's in the practice rooms and we don't sound very good. I said, I guarantee if you were in the practice rooms more, this rehearsal would sound better. And yeah. it just, it, it wasn't, they they just hadn't thought of it. 
you know, it's weird to me, but uh, they haven't uh, thought of it exactly. And it and it shows. I remember Matheny saying to me, "People don't realize how much I practice mm -hmm. to, to sound even halfway decent. I have to practice a lot, and people constantly don't understand that." And he, he said, "Even when I play for my." kids school and I have to play nursery rhymes for the kids which I do occasionally he said I have to practice two hours before I go to that class to play nursery rhymes and he said people have to understand that well, it's all about and what's interesting about that Richard to me is that it goes exactly along with your disdain for the word genius because this is it what uh, yeah there's this sort of uh romantic notion of yes. the, the uh, rugged individual says a jazz musician who just sprung fully formed from the head of Zeus. That's and, right. And, and, but man, you know, Louis Armstrong in his own way was shedding somehow. We know that John Coltrane was shedding. You know oh, what I'm saying? Yes. And, and so you don't, you don't just arrive without putting in the hours, you know, no. and, and it's good that Matheny, so, and some guys foster this too. There's some players oh. I know who foster like, I don't want anyone to know to practice. I He's want very just... against that. No, no, no. He, he, <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, I was lucky to, to have him as a teacher for a short time. And, and uh, he always, that was the number one thing. He said, you've got to, but also putting in the hours, you have to know how to put what in to good do. hours. Right. You know, some people think that practicing is playing. It's not. Sure. Some guys will say, I practiced eight hours, but they didn't do the right thing. You get better at one. You know, Matheny's work ethic on season Midwesterner, man. <laughs> that's, that's, absolutely. Yeah, cornbread, man. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, Is there anything in music, because there's a lot in life, but is there anything in music that you actually think cannot be taught? Because I have my ideas about this, but I would love to hear what you think. You know, it's not the first time I've contemplated that question. Uh, I think it's it's the degree of learning that can take place. Some areas, you can have a higher degree of learning occur than others, all right? Someone who has a time or swing problem, that's the most difficult to address. Now, I, over the years, have come up with techniques that have made things better. Let's hear them. Okay, the first one is singing along with recordings away from the horn. Right. Right. Good. Let's start with something simple. We just we just yesterday in the improv class we got graded on how well we could sing the first thirty two of, of Dexter's solo, uh, the head and the solo on second balcony jump. You nice. Know? And some of those students at the beginning of the semester, so this is eight weeks ago, made significant progress. Now, is their time feel exactly where we want it? No, it's not. But this is what I'm talking about with degrees. Will it ever get there? Yeah, eventually. It might take years and years, but it can get there. Mm -hmm. So that's the hard thing because that's like a language. The, the rhythmic, the element of rhythm in our world, in the jazz world, you know, that is a very unique thing that only exists in America. It came about in America. It was because of, you know, you can't have that without black America is the mm -hmm. way I like to think of it. It's not that... You have to be black American to do it, no. but it won't exist. Which reminds me of a funny thought experiment. I was a guest artist at um, uh, where the Caltech, you know, where they invent, you know, the JPL and all that. And the drummer was this nineteen-year-old kid. He played good, but he, you know, no one's a music major there, man. They're all scientists. He was uh -huh. working with the woman who just got the Nobel Prize in chemistry okay. two years ago, mm -hmm. and he he shared with me a thought experiment, and I thought, okay, that's beautiful. I wish I could remember his name. He's a great kid. I said, here's the thought experiment that I've been thinking about lately, because I'm teaching history of jazz, of course, for many right, years now. Right, sure. I thought, what would American music sound like if we didn't have slavery? Now, I can't share with you what an individual who was here at this concert in the green room, a famous musician, mm -hmm said in response, but he, he identified, he says, oh, that's easy. That would sound like so-and-so's band. <laughs> Which, you know, <laughs> yeah. oh. So, but it was, you know, not Hey, even, Kaiser. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, right, so not, thank you. Right? Something no, like that. Yeah. It, yeah, it was just so, so that's an interesting thing to think about because obviously slavery is horrible. I mean, you know. Sure. Shadow slave, whatever. But without it, we wouldn't have had this music, undoubtedly. Right. 
I mean, there's another point which I, I make a lot and also in a history of jazz kind of uh, context. Of course that's true, but the other thing is to ask the opposite question. What would black music sound like if it had not had European influence, influence as well? So the wonderful thing about jazz and the wonderful thing about music in general is to me that it completely is a unity of everybody coming together yep. rather than making delineations and pushing people apart. Mm -hmm. And that's always what what I think is the greatest thing about jazz. I mean, uh, Ray Charles said to me, I'm so glad that I'm blind. And I said, Ray, what do you, he says, no, he says, man, he says, when I hear music is the most important thing to me. So when I hear music and I hear a person playing, I don't care if they're black, white, I can't tell if they're a woman or a man. Mm -hmm. I just care if they can play. Right. And if they can play, that's it. They're my brother. Yeah. And, right. and, and you know, he went crazy about my friend Nigel Hitchcock, saxophone player, and he, you know, just wanted him to join his band immediately. It, and I thought that was a really telling thing that we should all be colorblind in that way, well, musically. And it's interesting because the musicians themselves were always colorblind. Um, sure. I mean, Lester Young was carrying around um, singing the blues by Bix Beider back in his case. And, exactly. the, and some of his African-American buddies would say, wait, why are you doing And he would say, I, they're telling some stories I like to hear. I mean, there was no, there's uh, blacks and whites recorded together from the very get-go. However, Williams, they yeah. couldn't perform. Right. Well, they weren't allowed to. Together until Benny Goodman did it with Teddy in 1936, exactly. I think. But, exactly. But, I mean, think about that. That's that's a pretty chunk, good chunk of time going by. And, what, 10 yeah. or 11 years before Jackie Robinson, Well, right? yeah, and before that, uh, I was saying Eddie Lang recorded with, I'm trying to remember the, the black guitar player he recorded with, but he had to name himself something else in order to reco even record right. with a black musician. So he named himself, you know... Blind Lemon Lang something, or something right. like that. To, well, to, and Eddie Lang itself was a... Uh, he was Italian and... Okay. And, yeah, because obviously Joe Venuti, Eddie Lang. Yeah. So they played... His, he had, his real name was Salvatore Massaro. Okay, that's what it was. Salvatore yeah. Massaro. And he couldn't use his Italian name because it was too much. So he chose Eddie something Lang. that sounded like an a, a, a Irishman. Okay. As yeah. musicians, that's the thing that we have... The ability to do, which is just bring everybody together, because well, that togetherness is important, but it's also interesting because there's there's a tradition of Italian Americans that play jazz, sure. but it's not. It's like you're saying, it, it's sort of a thing, you know, Louis Prima, you know, Frank Rosalino, right. Eddie Lang, but it's it's not an exclusive thing. It's an inclusive thing, and yeah. and that identity can be respected without saying this is the right one way. Yeah, it's got to be it. They, they, it's it's it totally embracing, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, it it is interesting. I often wonder. Yeah, I mean, it's just just culturally, what what our music would sound like without that part. Well, of that it's history. a it's a very good question, and it's a question which which brings other questions to mind, which is a great question. Yeah, you know, that's what a great question does. Yeah, um, I'm also interested um, in the fact that. Um, it seems to me, obviously, as a musician, we all have a amazing experiences with people and with situations. And one of the things I do on my uh, podcast, you guys know, uh, is I do musicians' funnies. And they're funny things that happen to musicians when they're trying to earn a living. <laughs> so, yeah. I, was just, I mean, I know that you have a great sense of humor, and I was just wondering if you had a couple of those funny things uh, you know what? You? These stories usually are better later in the day with a scotch in hand, and that's usually when I recall it. But I'll try. It. Here's the most I can give you is a banana muffin. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. So, so here's one of my favorites. I played in a group with Tony Malaby, who's this wonderful tenor saxophone player. Lives in New York now. Actually, he just got a full time job at Berkeley. He's okay. moved to Boston. Nice. He's a wonderful player. Really, sort of an out guy now. You know. If, if there is such a category. He's extremely melodic, but people, if they're going to classify him, they're going to say he plays pretty out. Out. And we had this group called the Malibu Sellers Quartet, and it was, uh, we, we recorded with New York bassist Mike Formanek and the drummer Billy Mintz, but when it was the LA guys, it was Trey Henry, Billy Mintz, myself, and Tony. And the music was a little bit 
forward thinking. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to book a little tour uh, down to San Diego and back, you know, just string some things together while uh, uh, Billy was going to be out from New York. He hadn't moved out here yet. And so I called this club up in San Diego that someone had recommended. And it sounded like a pretty people place. But I said, here's here, the, the music sport thing. And I sent them a CD so they'd know. They booked us, right? And we get there. And, you know, it was not the right environment for us to be playing this sort of thing. So we had to figure out, are we going to, like, play like a wedding band now? Or are we going to do our thing? Well, we're not going to go drive all the way down and not do our thing. Right. So we're playing. And not get paid. Yeah. Well, this is the funny thing about it. So we're playing our thing. We're playing soft. We're not playing loud. We're, we're, we, we're not going to try to blow anyone's groove. It's a restaurant, you know. Yes. All right. So we're being cool, but we're kind of playing our music just softer. <laughs> and the manager comes up to me. Uh, it's supposed to be a three-hour gig, I think. The manager comes up to me on the break and says, could you play something different? And I, th I, and I said, do you mean like bossa novas or something? I was playing trombone at first. He said, right. no, like a flute. <laughs> and so... I was like, I just, you know, that I thought, okay, this is the bottom. This is the bottom of the career. Wow. The guy paid us and we split. He didn't want to hear any more of it. So the guy, the guy, the guy paid us and we split um, and drove back. I, I sat in the back seat of my own car with a bottle of scotch. Well, well I, I, wasn't, I was pretty depressed. I, I was going to ask you about trombone jokes, but that's yeah. the best trombone joke I've ever Could heard. Could you play something else? <laughs> like more bosses? No, like flute. Fantastic. Oh, God. Now, that is, that is genius. Low that, moment. Now, that's genius. Yeah, low <laughs> moment in this career. Why do you think there is there are so many trombone jokes, though? Oh, you know, man, it's sort of a comical instrument, man. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, that's a funny motion. It makes funny sounds. It's got a very uh, vocal long. sound. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, you know. I mean, there's, there's jokes about every instrument. But there each, are. But each one of them. I, I mean, I actually looked on the internet. There are more trombone jokes than oh, really? any other. Yeah, I look, there's a lot of drummer jokes. Right, it That's makes a, sense. But, but, but trombone trombone jokes. Trombone players are generally. And violas. They, they're right, pretty equal. Relatively egoless, you know. Uh, you know, the trombone players are, they're in the middle of the band. A lot of trombone players end up becoming composers because they're in the middle of the band. Right. They're hearing everything. You know, trumpet players are traditionally, you know, sort of egotistical. Uh, sax players are always worried about women, getting with women, male sax players, you know, if they're heterosexual. Really? You know, drummers, you know, you know, like, you know, food, sex, they don't have a lot of, uh, traditionally, I'm saying this, the yeah, stereotype. Yeah, that's right. But the stereotype of the trombone player is, you know, someone who's pretty easy to get along with, you know, you know, doesn't usually do well in the romantic areas of life. And, and there's a, there are a lot of uh, jokes about trombone players being unemployable, which is yes. really not actually true. Not not actually true, but I remember one time, um, let's see, Wayne Bergeron was with one of those quintets doing an elementary school performance. Right. And they were talking about the different instruments and the distinctions, <laughs> and someone asked, Kind of towards Wayne, toward the whole group, and Wayne jumped in, of course. He said, they said, what's the difference between a trumpet and a trombone again? And Wayne said, oh, about 20000 a year. <laughs> you know. And then there was another great one where uh, Tim Hall, who's a wonderful trumpet player here locally, he, he teaches for us at Saddleback College for the classical dudes, excellent musician, one of my favorite people. And uh, my son went to school with his sons, who were both good musicians. And Tim um, was doing one of those quintet gigs at the elementary school and my daughter you know was in the audience so she raises her hand she's fifth grade you know okay she says so do any of you guys have a kazoo mute <laughs> and tim says let me guess your dad's <laughs> joke <laughs> yeah so oh, nice yeah nice nice well i would love to see your mute sometime um I I really would love to. I mean, if if you have time, we could play a tune. Sure, maybe yeah for that, fun. That sounds would good. That would be good. Yeah, let's do it. Do we have time? You do. And, but we have to have time for, time for that and a muffin. Okay, we can do it. Okay. Well, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to end stuff now. Okay. And then and then I then I can cut back. Uh, so Joey Sellers, thank you so much for being on Radio Richard. My pleasure, Richard. Thank you for having me. It's Great. been a pleasure to talk to you. You know. Thank you. Fantastic. Are you a long-distance truck driver who'll be driving across the country, stopping only at a filthy diner to relieve yourself of the interminable boredom? Great! While you're driving, join me, Richard Niles, for my podcast, Radio Richard. 
Intriguing interviews and peripatetic performances from master musicians like Randy Brecker, Wayne Shorter, Nile Rodgers, and the Yellow Jackets. <laughs> and even if you don't drive a truck, I can guarantee that Radio Richard will spin your tires. <laughs> don't miss a moment of the fun. Subscribe to Radio Richard. Thank you.